Stuff Podcasts. Hi, I'm Michael Wright, and welcome to The Long Read from Stuff, a new audio feature and podcast that showcases our best long form writing and lifts the veil a little to tell you how these stories came about. This week's feature is called Life on the Edge of the Olympics by Stuff National Correspondent Dana Johansson, who joins me now. Hi, Dana. Hi, Michael. So, Life on the Edge of the Olympics, those are some high stakes. What drew you to this as a story idea? I guess when I was thinking about how um, we cover the Olympics, we often are focused on the stars or the, or the big name athletes. And I was kind of drawn to the idea of wanting to cover someone who kind of had battled away on the fringes for a long time and was looking to qualify for the Olympic Games. Because often we see these people are just footnotes at the bottom of a story, but I really wanted to focus on their journey. And the subject of this story, as we'll hear, is a sprinter named Joseph Miller. How did you settle on him or find him as your subject? Yeah, I kind of went through sport by sport. I was looking for someone who had um, been around the scene for quite a while and maybe had a couple of cracks at qualifying for the Olympics before. I sort of got to track and field and I was looking around and um, thought of potentially doing Joseph Miller because it was an interesting time in his career as he had sort of been at the top for so long and was starting to get some competition at home with Eddie Osai and Ketia emerging. So that added another layer of, of interest in the story. So I called him up and asked if he'd mind uh, me following him around for a year or so. And I knew within about 30 seconds of talking to him that he would be the right person. He's very open, as, as you'll hear. Indeed. And on that note, tell us about this structure, how you settled on it, and the fact we're going to hear from Joseph in each of these five parts. Yeah, the feature is structured in five parts, and each part is a stage of a 200-metre race. And I guess each kind of stage is also a metaphor for where Joseph was at and his journey at that time as well. So he's talked me through, he's he's very articulate, he's an enthusiastic student of the sport, so he loves sort of sharing the science and everything of, of his sport. Um, so he talked me through each stage of the race and, and how you would, would approach it, and that I just sort of got stuck on that idea of that being a metaphor for his journey as well. And that journey takes some time. Uh, talk us through how that went and how that influenced the style of the story we're about to hear. Uh, yeah, so I started this initially in 2019, sort of looking at a year timeline uh, in the lead up to the Tokyo Games, which were originally scheduled in July 2020. Um, then, of course, COVID intervened, has, has played havoc on most people's lives, and Joseph was kind enough to let us follow him around for another year. So, yeah, it does, the, the timeline does jump around a bit. But, yeah, so it's told in present tense as, as we're sort of explaining it through, going through each stage of his journey. Thanks, Dana. Now, here is Dana reading her story, Life on the Edge of the Olympics. For each of the five parts, you'll hear an introduction from Joseph Miller himself. Part one, pre-race. There's a lot going on in a 20-second race even before you get to the start line. Joseph Miller's intensity scares even himself at times. For Miller, one of the mainstays of the New Zealand track scene for the past decade, making the Olympic Games is not a dream. It's more elemental than that. I don't want to be an Olympian, the veteran sprinter says. I need to be an Olympian. He is driven by an inextinguishable desire. He is driven by all that has come before, his past failures and successes. He is driven by an endless pursuit of running faster than he ever has before. And sometimes, he concedes, he is driven by fear. Looking ahead to next year, Miller told Stuff back in 2019 as he contemplated his third tilt at Olympic qualification. It's exciting, but it's also very scary. It's this really intense feeling of needing something so badly. It's scary because there's always a chance that it might not happen. As we get closer and closer to the Olympics, the fear gets greater and greater. Fear isn't the healthiest of emotions. It can be destructive, but it can also be an amazing motivator. Fight or flight, that sort of stuff. That one-year qualification window would become two years as the COVID-19 pandemic forced the postponement of the Olympic Games to July 2021. 
What wouldn't change in that period was Miller's propensity for disarmingly honest self-reflection. Miller is what you would call a deep thinker. He gives long, considered answers to even the most routine of questions. He starts slowly at first, tiptoeing from word to word. Then, when he is sure of his footing, he elaborates at length before arriving back, more confidently this time, at his original point with a neatly wrapped summation. It's as if he is using the time to explore his own thinking. Miller is one of around 1,000 Kiwi athletes on the New Zealand Olympic Committee's long list for Tokyo. NZOC Secretary General Kieran Smith estimates the final team will be about 200. More than 80% of Olympic hopefuls will miss the cut. Joseph Miller is 28. The Tokyo Games are, in all likelihood, his last roll of the dice to make the New Zealand Olympic team. It is a goal he has chased since 2012, when, in a blur of pale limbs, a teenaged Miller flew onto the sprinting scene, picking up the 100 and 200 metre double at the national championships. His ascent to the throne of New Zealand's fastest man was quick and unexpected. Suddenly, the Olympics were on his radar, although he admits it was a very, very long shot back then. Come his campaign for Rio in 2016, it felt like Miller's time had arrived. He threw everything at his bid. After failing to meet the A qualifying standard over the New Zealand and Australian track and field season, Miller obtained private sponsorship to base himself in the Lee Valley in northeast London, training against some of the top British sprinters, and, on the weekends, hopping from event to event around Europe to try and secure the elusive time. With each passing event, Miller's qualification window narrowed. His efforts became increasingly frantic. It came down to one final track and field meet in Switzerland. In a series of mishaps reminiscent of a scene from The Amazing Race, Miller learned his flight had been cancelled while in the back of a cab on the way to Heathrow Airport. On the cab ride, he hastily arranged new flights that required the driver to divert to Gatwick. Then he realised his flight would arrive too late to catch the final train to the Swiss town, leaving him facing the prospect of sleeping at the train station and arriving just in time for his event. Miller decided to pull the pin and return home. It was tough, he says. I really believed that I could do it. I have more knowledge now, and I now realise I probably wasn't as close as I thought I was. Sure, on a good day with perfect conditions, I might have been able to get there, but knowing what I know now, I believe I am much better set up to do the time and go faster than back then. Since 2016, Miller has notched up some significant milestones. He's become a five-time double national champion in the 100 and 200 metre events, broken Chris Donaldson's long-standing New Zealand record in the 200 metres, and claimed the New Zealand residence record of 10.18 seconds in the 100 metres, although he sits fourth in the all-time list behind Gus Nketia, Nketia's son, Eddie Orsai Nketia, and Donaldson. Miller has also represented New Zealand at two major black singlet events, the 2017 World Championships and the 2018 Commonwealth Games. The Olympics is the last box to check in his athletics career. That's where the fear comes in. To leave the sport without the complete set of the Commonwealth Games, World Champs and the Olympics, he says, it isn't something I'm willing to do. Part 2. The Start Off the mark you try to make it autonomous. You go into that zone where you hear set and your body just knows what to do. The more you relax, the less you consciously fight your body. For pretty much as long as Miller can remember, he's had one goal. To go fast. His obsession with speed was sown by an offhand comment from his father, David. When Miller was young, he was worried about being bullied by some of the bigger kids at school. 
Well, his father said, you'd better make sure you're faster than them. It was advice an impressionable young Miller took literally. The idea planted itself in his brain and he became fixated on needing to be quicker than everyone else. I was also pumped up by my childhood heroes on TV, he says. They were all fictional, like superheroes and stuff like that. It almost came from a want of just wanting to have superpowers and speed was one of those things that I would try to harness. After a while, his mother Bernadette began taking Miller, the oldest of her six children, three boys, three girls, down to club nights at the Papamoa Athletics Club near Tauranga. He was immediately hooked. To be that person that is the fastest in the class and then the fastest in the school was something that motivated me, he says. There was always someone faster, so I would find someone to lock down on and try to get faster than them. I kept picking people until I ran out of people to chase down. That methodical approach that revealed itself in Miller as a youngster is still evident today. Inside Miller's war room at Tauranga's Queen Elizabeth Youth Centre, two large year planners stretch out along the back wall. Next to the date, July 24, 2020, Miller has roughly drawn the Olympic rings. Everything else works back from this point. There is nothing after. The next 12 months of Miller's life are meticulously plotted out in colour-coded stickers. Each colour represents a different stage of training and competition. Blue and green stickers chart the off-season work. Blue is for improving quality and green improving quantity. Red represents the competition phase of Miller's season in which emphasis is placed on refining the competitive elements. Yellow is the taper phase in the lead up to a major event where the training load is reduced to optimise performance. Then there is black. Black means rest, both planned and unplanned. Among the rainbow of stickers are the key track and field meets Miller is targeting in his qualifying bid. There are two ways for Miller to qualify for Tokyo. The straightforward way is to meet the automatic standard, 10.05 seconds in the 100 metres and 20.24 in the 200 metres. Miller's career best performances are 10.18 and 20.37 respectively, meaning he would have to run faster than he ever has before. The other way for an athlete to qualify is by virtue of their world ranking based on their five best performances during the qualifying period. Under the new criteria introduced by World Athletics in 2019, an athlete's ranking is not just decided by times. It's an accumulation of points based on how fast you ran, the level of competition and final placing. It's like a decathlon score. Athletics New Zealand High Performance Director Scott Goodman says, they give you a points value for your actual result and then they add on bonus points based on the category of the meet. For example, a category C or D meet would give you 60 bonus points for a win, while a win at the Nationals would reap 100 bonus points. The Oceania Championships were a step up again, with 170 additional points awarded to winners. If it seems overly complex, that's because it is. It's fair to say it took me a bit of time to get my head around it, Goodman says. Why World Athletics decided to bring this in in an Olympic year bemuses me, but that is out of our control. Either way, Goodman says, Miller is up against it. The veteran is facing increased competition at home from impressive youngster Eddie Orsayenketia, who in mid-2019 had just announced his allegiance to New Zealand following a trans-Tasman tussle for his talents. Then there's an additional Olympic hoop all New Zealand athletes must jump through to make the team. Selection for Tokyo is ultimately determined by the New Zealand Olympic Committee, which has an additional criteria that athletes must demonstrate an ability to finish inside the top 16. Given there are already about 30-odd automatic qualifiers in the 100 metres, Goodman says, it's a really challenging argument to make. In a sport where competitors are chasing improvements by hundreds of seconds, breaking any new ground is hard fought.
to Miller, sprinting is both a complicated science and an art form. It is not so much a time he is chasing, but a feeling of transcendence that sprinters experience when everything clicks. The moment when the noise stops and the fear goes away. When it all comes together, Miller says, and everything is in sync, it's like listening to a motor start screaming into that high pitch until there is no sound at all. You don't feel the ground underneath your feet. It's almost like you're flying and you're not present in the moment, like you're experiencing it, but it's not you. It's just the most incredible feeling of sheer power. I try to visualize that feeling. I think that's what it'll feel like qualifying for the Olympics. I'll know it without even looking at my time. Hi, I'm Michael Wright, host of The Long Read. If you're an advertiser and you like what you're hearing, you could help us keep making podcasts like this one. Thousands of people listen to Stuff Podcasts every day. So if you'd like to be part of one of New Zealand's biggest and best podcast platforms, go to advertise.stuff.co.nz slash audio and get in touch with us. Back to the show. Part 3. The Bend. The drive phase in the 200 metres comes at the bend, so you're trying to reach top speed while you've got the centrifugal forces working against you. There were outside forces working against Miller from the beginning. Throughout his career, he has battled the laws of sporting economics. High Performance Sport NZ's targeted funding model dictates that the pool of funding allocated to elite athletes each year is directed towards those that show podium potential. Miller has received some government support over the years. He was a carded athlete up until a few years ago, receiving access to the High Performance Sport NZ gym and support services like nutrition, physio and sports science. But his carding was removed by mutual agreement as he tended to use his own people. For Tokyo, Miller is going it alone, funding and managing his own campaign. He has a couple of personal sponsors helping him in his bid. He gets gear from Adidas, most of his medical costs are covered, and a local car dealer has provided him with a vehicle and fuel. It is more about eliminating costs rather than getting money out of them, he says. Most of my training expenses are covered. All I need to do is feed myself. It still leaves a shortfall of travel costs and entry fees. He is doing some coaching in Tauranga at junior level, helping young kids go fast. Athletics NZ have also been supportive, he says, chipping in a small amount of funding for Miller to attend training camps and get across to a couple of events in Australia with Osai and Ketia. But it is an endless grind. When he was younger, he considered being a full-time athlete travelling the world to be living the dream. Now he is older and his friends are beginning to buy houses and get married and think about starting a family, the lifestyle has started to wear him down. It's not that he's worried about being left behind, he says, but the longer he sticks at it, the sacrifices he is making for a sport become more apparent. It's that sort of crap you have to deal with behind the scenes that does take its toll, he says. Miller has always had an independent streak, with a background in sports science, he is an enthusiastic student of the sport and its biomechanics, undertaking his own research. To him, training opportunities overseas are also an opportunity to study and learn from other athletes. When he can't get overseas, he'll spend hours on YouTube analysing the techniques of the top sprinters in the world. Former sprinter Gary Henley-Smith, who coaches Orsay and Ketia, says Miller's commitment to understanding his craft is unlike anything he's seen from other athletes. He has an unbelievable understanding of his particular event, says Henley Smith, who has gotten to know Miller during training camps. We can probably learn a lot from what Joseph does. He does some pretty cool things in his training, which is probably not done in other people's training around New Zealand. 
but Miller's insistence on doing things his own way has led to battles with the national body over the years. To some, Miller's rejection of the system is viewed as arrogance. Others say, why should he conform to a system that doesn't suit him? In more recent years, they have come to an understanding. I definitely have a better relationship with Athletics New Zealand now, says Miller. I think as they've gotten to know me better, they've sort of worked out where I'm at. I probably have a reputation as being difficult because I stick up for myself. I tend to be quite direct and to the point. If I see an issue, I will speak up. But it's more in a way that I will ask questions and challenge their thinking, not so much to shut them down, but I like to understand where they're coming from. Miller didn't always plan to coach himself for this campaign. In 2019, he moved down to Christchurch to work with Andrew McLennan. He found himself the world's worst flat, with dubious weather tightness, developed a chronic skin irritation that meant he couldn't sleep, and then broke his arm. Miller decided Christchurch was not where he was supposed to be. He returned to Tauranga a few months later, just in time to be back with family when they learned his mother had been diagnosed with stage 4 bowel cancer. For a man not interested in odds, the word terminal was harder to negotiate. It's been really tough, he says. It's hard to care much about training when you see your mum going through something like that. There were more disruptions to come, but none seemed that significant in the wider scheme of things. His summer season ultimately came to an end when he suffered a back injury during a misguided exhibition event in Mission Bay, ruling him out of competition. Come March 2020, Miller was facing the prospect of having to go overseas to try and get the job done. Athletics NZ was willing to grant him an exemption to prove himself, but he would have to hustle to find some money to get overseas and compete. Then, on March 25th, the day before New Zealand went into Level 4 lockdown, the International Olympic Committee announced the Tokyo Games would be postponed to 2021. COVID-19 had given Miller a do-over year. Part 4. The Strait The Strait is where you open up and give it your all. It's sort of like trying to be fast but patient at the same time. So try and turn it all the way up and try to get it to that last click right before it breaks. After the inertia, after the uncertainty, and after the ambiguity, came clarity. A renewed sense of purpose. Things began to move how Miller prefers it, at pace. Miller knew he needed a change. Looking back over the previous 12 months, he felt his most productive period was the time he'd spent in Wellington training with Orsay and Ketia. So he called up Orsay and Ketia's coach, Gary Henley-Smith, and asked if he could muscle in on the double-barrelled unit. Henley-Smith, a senior leader at Scots College, where Orsay and Ketia was in his final year, found Miller a role working at the school as a boarding supervisor. It meant Miller had an income, his food and accommodation were taken care of, and he could concentrate on his training. His mum's illness had given him a new perspective. That fear he felt about last chances and time running out, it wasn't there anymore. For me, knowing that this is probably my last chance helps stoke the fire more than anything, says Miller. My mother gets out of bed every morning and gets stuff done because she knows she doesn't have any days to waste, and I guess I feel something similar. I don't have an endless amount of time to get this done, so I want to make sure I'm doing everything I can to get there. The arrangement with Henley Smith is that Miller will still manage his own programme, with the veteran coach acting in more of a mentoring role. Miller and Orsay and Ketia are very different sprinters, both in size and strength, and technique. So they need different approaches to training. But for the speed sessions, they partner up. Those sessions awaken the competitiveness in both athletes. 
I think a lot of people think that as Eddie is a rival, that any interaction I have with him might be trying to get an advantage on him, Miller says. But I'm not like that. How I look at it is if he is faster, then I will have to get faster too. Pushed or pulled, you cross the line faster. In Wellington, Miller began to see what might lie beyond athletics. Along with being a boarding supervisor, he also helped out with the Scots College first teams as a strength and conditioning coach. Joseph is very much suited to that mentoring type role, says Henley Smith. He is very personable but straightforward at the same time. I think he could be a very good teacher actually, so I'm hoping in the long term that he might go that way. Henley Smith, a former pro rugby league player and sprinter who represented New Zealand at the 1990 Commonwealth Games, knows the struggle of putting your career on hold to chase sporting ambitions. I know what it's like to be in that situation, he says. You have to make a decision whether or not you're going to develop your career and actually start earning money. That's what I really appreciate about Joseph. He just loves his sport and he's trying to do the best he can, even though he's not funded or anything. Miller has taken steps to re-enrol in university to complete his sports science degree. He thinks after that he might give teaching a crack. But his focus for now remains the Olympic Games. And whispers are, Miller is blitzing it in training. Heading into the summer season, Henley Smith says Miller is well ahead of his own charge, or Sayanketia. It's hard to gauge, but he thinks Miller could produce times of 10.0 something, maybe even 9 point something. There are caveats, of course. A sprinter's performance can be heavily impacted by the time of day events are run, the direction the wind is blowing, and the heat and humidity. Even in the New Zealand summer, there are limited windows of opportunity to run fast. Miller is confident he has mastered all the elements he can control. I've done stuff in training that I've never been able to do, even in races, he says, and I've always been one step up for races. Some nights... I struggle to get to sleep because I'm so excited about the times I'm hitting and training. The margins of improvement I'm putting out week to week, it is all pointing towards running faster than I ever have before. Hi, Michael Wright here. If you're enjoying this podcast, maybe you'd like to check out one of our others. Collapse is the story of the CTV building, which collapsed in the Christchurch earthquake in 2011, killing 115 people. We have a building on fire with persons trapped that we're trying to get out. It's the story of one tragedy in a city full of them, about how a building went up. It shouldn't have got through council. How it came down. And this level collapsed first. The people who were saved. She went from, I'm going to die, to a realisation, I'm going to live. And the 115 who weren't. This is a grown man in tears because they couldn't rescue these people. It's also a story about a search for the truth. Why did one unremarkable office building in the central city collapse like no other? How did almost two-thirds of Christchurch's entire earthquake death toll die in this one building? And most of all, was anyone responsible? Go to stuff.co.nz slash collapse or subscribe wherever you get your podcasts. If I don't get fire service here soon, they're going to die from the fire. Part 5. The Finish. If you get it right and have planned and executed the race correctly, there should be nothing left in the tank at the finish line. You should die on the line. The end came sooner than expected. Just 30 metres into one of the first races of the 2021 season. That's when Miller's Olympic torch effectively flamed out. Porritt Stadium in Hamilton, named after Arthur Porritt, the pioneer of New Zealand athletics, has been the stage for Miller's strongest performances of his career. His New Zealand record in the 200 metres and personal best in the 100 metres were both achieved at the track in 2017. In February 2021, 
the Pirate Classic was the scene of Miller's undoing. Lining up in the start blocks in the heat of the day alongside Osei and Ketia and Canterbury's Tian Welpton, the 100 metres shaped up as an opportunity for Miller to produce a fast time. But the moment he lurches out of the blocks, he does not look comfortable. Sprinters aim to explode from the blocks, getting taller and taller with each stride until their body is upright. Miller looks lopsided, his head pitched at a strange angle. Quarter of the way down the track, he pulls up suddenly, grabbing his left leg. Miller hobbles the remaining distance to the finish. His official time? 17.09 seconds. Joseph Miller there, not looking good over the line, the stadium announcer observes as Miller limps off the track while the two new stars of New Zealand sprinting embrace. After a long wait, Osai and Ketia is declared the winner in a time of 10.28 seconds, with Welpton a tick behind at 10.30. I felt my knee kind of wrench about 30 metres in, Miller explains later. Miller has been battling inflammation in his knee for weeks, restricting his ability to train. The black stickers piled up on his wall planner. It severely affected his performances on the track. It's not so much as painful, he says, more of a damp sensation, like he's walking around on a cushion, making him unable to exert force into the ground. To most realists, it would appear Miller's Olympic campaign is over. His early season form and the injury disruption means Miller has been unable to accrue the points he needs to elevate his ranking. His only chance of qualifying now is to turn up to the National Track and Field Championships in March 2021 and run faster than he ever has before. But there is no talk from Miller that this is the end of his season. There is still time, he says. There are still options. He'll go back to Tauranga, talk to his medical advisors there, maybe get cortisone injections. He remains outwardly confident that if he can just get the issue sorted, he is still capable of producing the times he needs. On the days I've had less swelling in the knee, I'm running faster than I ever had, he says. I know that it's there. I just need a chance. That chance did not arrive. Only the creeping realisation that it was over. In late March 2021, the week before the rescheduled national meet in Hastings, Miller makes the call. His injury has not improved and he isn't anywhere close to the form he needs to be in to run the times required. He is not going to nationals. He is not going to Tokyo. I knew that it wasn't a case of turning up to qualify, which means running faster than before, he says. The chance of me turning up and running, say, at my previous best and no better, that wasn't going to happen either. It just turned into one of those things where, is this going to be fun or is it going to be a reminder that you're not where you could have been? I just decided I didn't want to put myself through any more of that. Miller is not prepared for this to be the end. The postponement of the Olympic Games has condensed the competition schedule over the next few years. There's the Commonwealth Games in Birmingham in 2022 to aim for, along with the World Championships. And he's still not willing to shut the door on Paris 2024. I think I'm still at the stage of accepting that I won't be in Tokyo, he says. It's hard to tell myself that, no, this is not going to happen but also to understand what that means. To accept that a no now might mean a no forever. I'm not there yet. Accepting that he will not be an Olympian would also mean accepting that, unlike the superhero movies that inspired him growing up, there will be no tidy redemptive arc to his career. Few athletes get their perfect ending to check every box, to live out the narrative they write for themselves. 
No matter the effort and the preparation, the outcome can't be controlled. There are injuries and setbacks, results that sting, unrealised dreams and what-ifs that linger on the edge of the subconscious long into retirement. Miller is asked if he still needs to be an Olympian. I don't know, he says. It's hard to answer that right now. This last year, I really went all in and had the best structure around my training and my life. I had the most optimism I've ever had, where it wasn't, I wonder how fast I can run. It was, I'm going to run fast. So in terms of regrets, I don't really have any. I know I gave it everything I had. Maybe, in the end, all Joseph Miller really needs is to know that he died on the line. That was Life on the Edge of the Olympics on The Long Read from Stuff, written and read by Dana Johansson and produced by me, Michael Wright. This episode was mixed by Sam Scannell. Stuff's podcast director is Adam Dudding. If you listen via our website, you can hear this story and more like it on the Long Read podcast, available on all the usual platforms. If you like what you heard, please give us a five-star rating and a review. It helps other listeners find us. Thanks for listening.